I was born as Gary Busby in uh, London in 1956, but I've been in the Middle East now for 25 years. I had a pretty normal English upbringing, I guess, you know, city boy, uh, moved out to the new towns when I was a teenager. Fairly uneventful life, yeah, nothing to report about that at all, and uh, definitely no religion in it. You know, I was, never, uh, I was never a Christian, that's no surprise, I guess that's most people. So I think I was typical in that respect. I was never convinced that I was doing the right thing on anything. You know, obviously my career wasn't necessarily the thing I wanted to do. Uh, you know, accountancy, like I say, yeah, it's a passport to, uh, to being able to work wherever you like. But it's no fun. It's never set my heart on fire. And there was never anything else. You know, I was never entirely comfortable with other aspects of my life. So I was always trying different things, always trying to see, is it travel I want? Is it working with my hands, you know, doing, fixing cars or building houses, you know, or painting or writing poetry? I tried all of these things. And yeah, you can do them, but you know, none of it quite clicked. I found myself going to Bahrain in the summer of 1984. It was kind of a bad day to arrive, the 1st of June, it was the 1st of Ramadan also. So I arrived in Bahrain to find that there was uh, nothing to drink and nothing to eat, which was kind of interesting. Uh, that was. Uh, a bit of positive immersion in the culture. On the other hand, some things were not what I expected. On the way over, I'd grabbed my phrase book and I was trying to learn a few things. I was learning to say, ahlan wa salam, you know, hoping that people would say this to me back, you know, in welcome, you know, and I would say, mahaba, and I would say, assalamu alaikum. But they didn't do that. I got off the plane and a nice Bahraini man came up to me and said, hi. You Gary? I said, yeah. He said, hi, I'm Ali. Nice to meet you. Shook my hand. Cadillac's parked over here. So it wasn't what I expected. And that's what I found after that, is that everyone was speaking English to me. So my hopes to be, I don't know, somehow some adventurer in Arabia and uh, learning Arabic language and being immersed in the culture. So much of this was uh, were kind of washed away in the first couple of days. And I think it was probably Quite at least a week later, I think I was walking in the souk in Manama when I first really heard the, the Adan, clearly. As I was walking in the souk and I heard the Adan, and I could hear it was a voice. It wasn't a bell, it wasn't a tune, you know, a ringtone. It was, it was somebody saying something. So I asked somebody in the next day, it wasn't, there was nobody around to ask at that day that I, could, that I could rely on to ask, but I asked the next day, what was that? And there was a very nice, uh, Persian lady in the office, a good Muslim lady, and she explained to me. She said, oh, it says this. And I said, does it say every time like that? And she said, yes, almost the same. One is slightly different, but mostly the same. I said, wow, that's amazing. And I said, does it work? I mean, they're asking people to come and they're coming. And she said, yes, that's the idea. They're asking them to come, so they come. It's as simple as that. I said, well, that's, that's absolutely great. And that's what I saw. And I saw the people coming to the mosque and I was at the way that all the men shut their shops and dropped their tools and got out of their taxi and locked it and went into the mosque. And I thought this is pretty impressive, but it's coming from the West, where once a week on a Sunday, maybe, and then only a maybe, 10% or less of the people might just wander to the church, perhaps. So this five times a day, jumping out of bed, jumping out of your office, sleeping out of your car, whatever it was, to hurry into the mosque, five times. Wow, how can it be five? It's too much. And I was just amazed. So I started to ask more questions, and I got answers, and I kind of started to gain some knowledge. In 1993, I moved to Turkey with the company I was working for at the time that was looking to open new business there. This was a, a great time for me, the beginning of one of the happiest times of my life. Turkey was probably the place I've been looking for all these years. I don't know what it was I was looking for, but I somehow seemed to find it there. There I was in Turkey. Uh, I hate not to use the word, but it's a, it's a real place. It's a place where the foreigners are in a tiny minority and the Turks run their own country. And you have to learn the language, you have to learn the customs, you have to behave as they do, you have to fit in. 
and this was just fantastic. This was, I think, what I needed. I needed to be able to find something that was uh, like a taste and smell and feel. One of the important things that happened during that time was that although Turkey is uh, ostensibly a, a country of Muslims, of course it's a secular democracy, as they say, which means that the Muslims have to make their own way inside their own country. They're not made easy for them by the, uh, by the government, and so they have to do their own thing. When it comes to Ramadan, I was kind of surprised. I was ready for the Gulf approach, where immediately there was no drinks, no food or anything in the daylight hours, and life took on a different style, you know, with the different working hours and everything. None of this, they didn't have it. The, in Turkey, the uh, normal life goes on, and the life of the Muslim there is just to fit in around that situation. And I soon realized there was two sorts of people. You know, there were those that fasted and stayed with it, and there were those that didn't. What I found was I fitted in best with the group which was fasting. I have no idea why that was. That I can't explain to this day. So it was in the first few days of my first Ramadan in Turkey that I thought, let me try this. And so immediately I tried to see if I could undergo the, uh, the, the rigors of fasting. A little tough at first, obviously, because I'd never done it in my whole life. In the office uh, during Ramadan, um, obviously half the people were fasting and half weren't. People had lunch in the office, or they didn't. Those of us that didn't, we waited through to the day, and when the day finished, around 5.30 or so, and the sun was starting to go down, we would start to gather in the canteen. And of course there was that fantastic air of anticipation, and this was the first time I'd experienced this. This was the first time I'd found myself surrounded by people who were focused on the idea that the iftar was coming, and that they were waiting for it, and that it was special. The atmosphere was magic. The people were sitting around small bowls of dates, there were glasses of iran, uh, water, and people were waiting to have this. One guy with the radio pressed to his ear, because we were a long way out of town, we were in the countryside somewhere, a guy was waiting for the Adan on the radio, and eventually it would come, and he would say, Yalla, it's now. And we would all dive on the dates, and immediately the energy would start to come back into the room, and people would start to talk, and the noise level would lift, and the people would start to laugh as they got some dates inside them, and some milk, and some water, and some juice. And the atmosphere was marvelous. Then there'd be some shaking of hands and some exchange of some stories. How was your day today? Oh, it was a bit tough today. Oh, I was suffering a bit during the afternoon. Still, I wasn't a Muslim, but I was enjoying this. So it was between my first and second Ramadans in Turkey that I was finally able to visit mosques. I found I could go into a mosque, uh, ostensibly as a tourist. I was able to visit the famous Osmanli uh, mosques of Istanbul, the mosques such as the Sultan Ahmed Jami, the Yeni Jami, the Sultan Ahmed and Sulaimaniya Jami, so all these uh, great mosques that have been built by Mimar Sinan. And I was able to enter them, just giving salams to the guy on the door, going in, taking off my shoes, sitting down. And this was, again, another revelation, sitting in the mosque, whether the guys were praying or not. And I could sit at the back, and nobody really minded, and I could absorb the atmosphere. Of course, I still didn't understand what they were doing, up to this point, no one had given me Quran. This is the amazing thing. I could now probably pass a GCSE or a baccalaureate in Islam because I'd read so much, so many textbooks, and spoken to so many people. I knew the life of the Prophet I knew many, many factual things, but what I didn't know was the Quran itself. Finally, one excellent guy, one Erkan Girai, uh, a very fine man, Turkish diplomat, but uh, he was visiting, actually. He was even though he wasn't living in Turkey. He met me. And he said, ah, oh, this won't do. You really need to read the proper thing. You need to read the book. And he bought me a Yusuf Ali translation with the Arabic and the English in it, and the decent tafsir, a good quality print. He said, read this. And if you read this, then maybe you'll answer a few more of your questions. And so I did. Over the, some ensuing weeks and months after that, I read the Quran. And of course, I had made some questions, and I had to find a book on hadith. Not easy to find in English in Turkey, but uh, you know, it could be done and I was able to read a bit more, and suddenly I had a lot of questions. Up to now, I've been satisfied with Islam as a very nice thing that everybody seemed to be enjoying, everybody seemed to be happy with it, and it was part of their life, but it wasn't for me. Now I'd read it, and I realized, oh, really, this is for everybody, so what's my excuse? I didn't have an excuse, what I had was questions, thousands and thousands of questions. <laughs> الكريم العزيز حكيم الرحيم الحليم السلام يا سبحان الله 
يا سبحان So in 1997, after a very, very interesting three and a half years in Turkey, I came back to Dubai through a series of coincidences of people you know and chance circumstances. But yet again, Dubai brought me back. At the time, I wasn't sure why. I couldn't think why I was coming back to Dubai. But I think I realized soon afterwards. I joined the Belhassa family business. And there I found something a bit special. There I found a someone who's your boss and is your friend. And uh, quickly I became very close with uh, some members of the family, particularly Majid Belhasa. And uh, he kind of took me under his wing and he discovered to his dismay that I'd uh, learned a great deal about Islam, but I had not made any proper use of it. In other words, quite simply, I hadn't embraced Islam. After many conversations we'd had in the first year I was there, he came to me one day and he said, ah, he said, I think there might be some guys here who might be able to answer some of your questions at last, some European Muslims. Well, I've got this interesting idea that they can reintroduce the gold dino and the silver dirham as the currency of the Muslims on a global basis. I, being an accountant and being General Smart Alec, said, absolutely no way, they must be nuts. No chance, forget it. And he said, fantastic, that's great, because we're having dinner with them tonight, so maybe you can tell them yourself. And I, in combative mood, said, yeah, sure, you know, yeah, I'll sort them out, I'll tell them why it doesn't work. And so we met these guys, one, uh, two Spaniards, one German, as it was uh, at the time, in that group. And we had a very interesting conversation. And this, of course, was the conversation I guess I've been waiting for for a long, long time. So I asked my questions, it went on like this. Eight o'clock, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. The restaurant threw us out, we stood out in the street. Midnight passed, we still stood in the street. We stood there in Gahud. The year was 2000, it was May. It was a Wednesday night, and about half past midnight or so, eventually, one of these guys said to me, so, have we answered all your questions? And I stood there with my hands on my hips, and I looked up at the sky, and I looked down at the ground, and all those things you do when you're searching desperately for an escape route, thinking, I must be able to get out of this somehow. I seem to have been cornered in this argument. And I said, no, I guess I've answered all the, uh, the questions now. And they said, fine, then you need to come along on Friday and say the Shahada. And I said, what? And by the, the time we shook hands and left that evening, I'd agreed that's what I would do. Sure enough, that Friday morning, I got up that morning and realized this was gonna be a kind of a different day. I took Russell and I went to see them. We had breakfast and we went round to the uh, Grand Mosque in Jumeirah. It was for the Juma prayer, so the place was full, really full. Now, I don't know how many, more than a thousand men in there, full up to the outside, inside, everywhere. And the Sheikh was as much surprised as I was to find himself with some white guy from heaven knows where, suddenly turning up to shake his hand to say, Shadawan la ilaha illallah wa Shadawan la Muhammadun Rasulullah for him. And we were very happy. And 800 or 1,000 men were also very happy. I was never been hugged so much. I was hugged to death. And I met some people that day who are still my friends now. People who I met in that mosque at that time are still my friends on a daily basis now. I had a very crazy day. I went around and I visited people's houses, local people's houses, two different mosques, and many things washed over me like a great big wave. And I found myself praying at home the next day and crying, not sure what to make of sure of what I'd done, just knowing that I turned over a big page. Anyway, that page stayed turned. I've never looked back.